it's a bird, it's a plane, it's today's topic. Writer Jerry Siegel and artist Joe Schuster, the co-creators of Superman. Welcome to another episode of The Real Heroes. I just wanted to remind you to subscribe to the feed and publish reviews on YouTube, Spotify, Google, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. Remember to download the episodes, and if you want to support the show, you can find The Real Heroes on Patreon. Today's guest is Andrew Lorenzo, better known as Melbourne Superman. I am your host, Michael Lay, and this is The Real Heroes Podcast. Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster were born mere months apart in the year 1914. They both came from Jewish immigrant families, and both worked fairly modest jobs throughout their adolescence. Yeah, you know, looking at the, the, the creators of Superman, you have to look at that religious, that religious story. You know, being of Jewish descent, you know, being the, the son of somebody who immigrated, and you, 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 have to, you have to take your heritage. And Superman has always been that, that godlike, whether it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Moses or it's a Jesus or it's any other type of, you know, religious figure, you know, they've used their own experiences and growing up in that world to create this character that is, is essentially a god and, and there to help. And I think when they created him, it was, it, it was something that they could look up to, you know, they, they had that they had that vision of something that they wanted in their lives, something that they wanted for a better future for all of us. And I think that's what came out in the story of Superman. Although Siegel and Schuster practically invented the superhero, they based Superman on previous hero archetypes, including 1897's Van Helsing, 1912's Tarzan, 1919's Zorro, and 1934's Flash Gordon. Beyond Pulp Fiction, Siegel and Schuster looked to mythology and religion for inspiration. kal spaceship his parents place him in is the Basket of Moses. The Kents are the Egyptians that take him in, and Lex Luthor is the Egyptian slave master. There are also parallels to Jesus Christ, as jor is a father, sending his only son to Earth. Siegel and Schuster's work also evokes Übermensch, the philosophical German Superman, one who would blaze his own path. Siegel and Schuster were interviewed in 1981 by BBC4 for the program The Comic Strip Hero. They discussed Superman's creation and legal disputes. Well, Superman came about because uh, both Joe Schuster and I were uh, great science fiction fans back in the 1930s. And to fill you in a little on the really the beginning of it all, one night, as has been mentioned in the past stories, ideas kept coming to me, and I kept getting up again and again during the night and just jotting down these ideas and uh, these scripts until uh, very early the next morning, I dashed over to Joe's house, which is about 10 blocks away. I, I showed him the uh, script of Superman, the entirely new concept in which there would be a meek, mild man, a reporter, Clark Kent, uh, Lois Lane, who scorned him, but who was, uh, who flipped over su- uh, Superman, not knowing that Superman and Clark Kent were one and the same person. Now, you want to stay? Was, you want to stay with your reaction? Well, I was, was very, you... very excited about the whole idea. I just, uh, I just uh, uh, took on uh, the same enthusiasm. <laughs> I, I thought it was a terrific idea, and we went right to work. Uh, right then and there. You sat down at the at, drawing was, board and, you, be, and you began day. designing the, uh, the way the characters yeah, would look, Yeah, we right? spent the entire day working on it, all afternoon, and, and we uh, at the drawing board, Jerry and I. And, uh, now, I remember designed, that the uh, matter of, of the costuming of Superman yeah, came up, and, and yeah, I, I remember uh-huh. two suggestions I made well, to you. One that the letter S well, be, be on his chest. Right, as I wanted a to give him a skin tight costume to, to show up his physique, for one thing. And then Jerry suggested putting on a, a, cape. a cape. So that when the character zoomed uh, so through the air, it would give more, more action and movement make to the it look character. look like he's really flying. 
yeah. and uh, very very and colorful. of course yeah you added all those and additional colorful. things like yeah, the yeah. the boots and the yeah. belt and the yeah. and, and the whatever I want to make it as simple as possible yeah. and what about Clark Kent well uh, uh, both Joe and I uh, you know wear glasses you know most of the times and it uh, occurred to me that uh, there was no uh, adventure comics to appear at that time who wore glasses so I thought it would be quite uh, different to have Clark Kent wear glasses well, it's funny. I think in terms of Superman, you can't have Superman without the just the epic characters that come along with him. Because, I mean, when you think of Superman, you think of Lois Lane, you think of Lex Luthor. Yes, you think of even Jimmy Olsen and Perry White. That's the that's the the way that you create a story. Is it would have been so easy to just have a story about this man from you know from outer space at humanity by allowing him to interact with characters around him and to interact with with people that are going to enrich his life and that's where that's where he becomes a relatable character you know you you can't just have this superhuman being because yes whilst it's exciting whilst it's fun people can't relate to that and that's what at the time i mean this is right around the great depression that's what people at the time needed, right? They needed something that they could relate to, not just a savior, but a savior that they could imagine themselves having a conversation with, having a relationship with. And I think that that was the big difference. And that's why he's lasted for 90 years. In order to guarantee relatability, Siegel and Schuster crafted the alter ego of Clark Kent, Daily Planet reporter, where Superman wears bright and bold colors, Clark wears beige. Where Superman has amazing vision, Clark wears glasses. Where Superman is physically assertive, Clark Kent has a slouch. From 1943 to 1946, Siegel served in the American Army. He was stationed in Honolulu and wrote comedic columns for the military newspaper Stars and Stripes. In 1947, DC Comics debuted Superboy, which spurred Siegel and Schuster to sue the company to reclaim ownership of Superman. On May 21st, 1948, DC settled for $47,000 each. Well, I, look, I think in terms of, of Jerry, uh, Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, I think they kind of... It was really unfortunate the way that everything went down because, of course, it was, you know, they sold the product for $130. I mean, that same that same product today, if they were around today, if that character was created today, you're not getting less than, you know, seven figures for, for a product like that, right? Probably eight figures. And I think a lot of people, they took advantage of that because, I mean... You know, 80 years ago, laws, whilst there, they weren't really there to protect people like they are today. So it was a lot easier to get away with it. And settling on $47,000 is just, it's just really, it makes you feel horrible for how, how they, 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 the, the, the run of it that they had. Because, I mean, these two, these two kids from, you know, from back in the day they could have had such a life but really everything was kind of they were taken advantage of I think unfortunately you know I, and I'm not look I'm not saying that uh, so much bad came from it unfortunately you know some of the greatest things are forged in fire I just I don't think that you know, I, I don't think that them being cheated out of the Royal Superboy, it was, it was, it was all the other merchandising, it was the radio uh, shows and the adaptations, it was, it was everything. So I think that they kind of, for lack of a better term, got pretty hosed on the deal. <laughs> but I think, you know, and, and I know I'm jumping ahead here, I think people like Richard Donner kind of, you know, paid them homage when he was creating Superman the movie and he had them as, as sort of consultants for it, which I think was something. By 1965, the settlement had run out. Both Siegel and Schuster struggled to pay rent, supply for their families, and generally scraped by. In 1975, the production of Superman the Movie was confirmed. DC artists Jerry Robinson 
and Neil Adams used this publicity to spotlight Siegel and Schuster hitting hard times. Responding to the drama, Warner Brothers placed them on an annual pension, $25,000 each, and health benefits in exchange for never contesting ownership of the property, along with a reinstated byline, which was dropped after their first lawsuit. Well, I think I think that there was a lot of sort of rough waters at that time in general. I mean, when they decided to make Superman the movie, of course they had originally had another director who wasn't Richard Donner, but they didn't like where that was going. So the whole thing, from the beginning, it was a tough... They had a tough go of it because they needed to make Superman relevant, right? They had to... They, they wanted to get away from, say, the campiness of superheroes that, you know, at that time there was Superman was a musical. I think the musical is still floating around sometimes. Uh, there was the Batman sh uh, show, the live action show, and they didn't want that. So there was a lot of challenges with that in and of itself. And the fact that here were these two creators of Superman who were now throwing another sort of spanner in the works or a, you know wrench in the cogs it's kind of like how do you how do you do this and i think i think to bring them on as consultants was probably maybe a little bit too little too late unfortunately for them but i think i hope and from what i've heard from people like jim bowers and the caped wonder website i think that they made that experience for jerry and joe as as you know, as positive as they could. Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster no longer own Superman. In 1938, they sold the rights for $130 to DC Comics, now a division of Warner Communications. They own the new feature films, Superman 1 and 2. Siegel and Schuster had to stand by and watch their creation become a multi-million dollar industry. After years of litigation, Warner's finally agreed to give them $25,000 a year each for life. The road that led to the spectacular success of the recent films began with the radio serials of the 1940s. Of course, Warner Brothers were not the only ones profiting off of Superman's soaring success. In 1981, Andy Warhol painted Superman from Myths, which eventually sold for $173,000. Schuster died on July 20th, 1992. Siegel died on January 28th, 1996. They both died of heart failure. In 1986, Superman was referenced in the Genesis single, Land of Confusion, which reached the American Top 5. However, that was nothing compared to the cultural phenomenon that was the 1992 comic book, The Death of Superman, as described by DC's Jeff Johns, in the 2013 documentary, Strong Characters, Legendary Roles. You see Superman reinterpreted and kind of his mythology expanded every decade in reaction to what's going on there. You can see the subtext to it all, but for me personally, the one I, I lived through was the 90s. And in the 90s, all these new badass, edgy superheroes were coming out and it made Superman look irrelevant. Like Superman was the Boy Scout, he was the do-gooder, he wasn't that tough, and so they killed him and they did this massive story called The Death of Superman, which most people probably read or remember hearing about, and suddenly they took something away, and it was the biggest selling comic book ever. It was huge. It was like this black bag with this bloody red S, and everybody demanded to know when he was gonna come back. You can't kill Superman. And then the return story was the biggest story in comics that whole year. It was huge, and it was a great, great story. And that was kind of the most metatextual take on the character, saying that, that death can't even beat Superman. And it was funny because uh, I, I am a, a filmmaker myself. I'm an actor myself. And I was speaking about this with somebody the other day. Uh, and I said, you know, it's a really exciting thing when, say, you create a script and then you see it being spoken aloud for the first time by an actor and it brings that story to life. For them, I mean, it's got to be bittersweet, right? Because... They had seen their story come to life so many times before Christopher Reeve took to the skies and made us all believe a man could fly. But it was also a lot of litigation and negativity, you know. It wasn't, 
I think, a great experience for them. But I have heard such wonderful things about their reaction to Superman, the movie, that I would have to imagine that taking that with them, knowing that they started this character... Like, who knows? Like, who knew where this character would, would go? I mean, there are a handful of recognizable symbols in the world. I mean, it brings tears to my eyes just talking about it, that you can look back at and know exactly from anywhere in the world who it is. And Superman is probably right at the top of that list. And I would imagine that knowing that they created that character and, and how far it's come must have been a wonderful thing for them. Yes, there was a lot of negativity there in past years, but I would hope that at some point they were able to find comfort in the fact that they had given so much to so many. Although Siegel and Schuster themselves have passed on, Superman lives. In 2001, the WB debuted Smallville. The series prioritized Clark Kent over Superman and romance over action. Tom Welling played the role. In 2013, we saw the Zack Snyder directed Man of Steel film in which Henry Cavill played the role. And whether it's 1996's Kingdom Come or 2013's The New 52, there is absolutely no shortage of Superman comic books. I think for me, and what I imagine a lot of people would would embrace as well, is, is it becomes... Because look, there are so many different versions of Superman over the last 80, 90 years. And it's not just it's not just one character it's 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 an ideal it's an idea it's it's a mythos it's it's a way of life it's the idea of superman like when somebody asks me what my favorite thing about superman is i rarely say it's i mean i have a favorite superman actor of course christopher reeve i have a favorite version but if somebody asks me what my favorite part of superman is i don't say the actor i say it's it's that struggle within himself it's that humanity within him it's that relatability that he's not always going to do the right thing but he tries to and yes he is quote and unquote an alien from from outer space of course but aren't we all you know aren't we all aliens in some way whether whether myself i'm an immigrant to australia or immigrants to another country or you know strangers to a new friendship or a new relationship or a new job it's just it's so much relatability there and knowing that he's not perfect people always say that superman is is a boring character because he's so strong and he's so this and he can do anything but that's not the point the point is he has a choice as all of us do and you see him go through the process of making those choices and sometimes they're not always the right ones but whatever choice he makes he lives with the consequences of and just that whole thing makes it so relatable and that's why it's transcended time because like i said in the beginning you're not just having this godlike character you're having a godlike character that conceivably could be any one of us in terms of his feelings his emotions his day-to-day -day life aside from flying of course the people were crying out for a savior, anything. And they found it in Superman. It was just a light, a beacon of hope, as he always has been. And yes, he came at the right time and people looked at it, they were entertained, they were inspired. And they found hope in the middle of a very hopeless time for some. And that is a wrap for this week's episode. Be sure to jump over to the Patreon. Mm -hmm.